So Martyr's Mirror is a study of the identity of martyrdom and persecution in early New England. Uh, why did New Englanders, even when they had political power, even when they were the magistrates and the judges, why did they continually see themselves as persecuted? And this persecution took a variety of forms. It could be um, that they had a bad harvest. It could be that they were sick. Um, an epidemic of smallpox. It could be a Native American attack was interpreted as a form of anti-Christian persecution against the true church. And so you see they were reading their own life experience through the lens of this narrative of the true persecuted church. And so the book uh, explores the literary paths by which this folklore of martyrdom made its way to New England. And then I explore this historical imagination of martyrdom in very specific contexts in early New England. So I look at the antinomian controversy, one of the big theological um, debates in early Massachusetts. I look at Quakers and Baptists and various dissenting groups who use the folklore of martyrdom in their own quest to resist unjust power. And so one of the big conclusions that I draw from the book is that the folklore of martyrdom is available to everyone. There's no way that the group who happens to be in power at the time can control the ways that the stories of the martyrs are used. They're uh, a repertoire, they're a resource for all different kinds of people in early New England. I was reading through the New England Primer, which is one of the earliest textbooks in America. It's a textbook for school children and, of course, for their parents as well. And, um, you know, you have the alphabet with uh, the Proverbs, and then you have the one-syllable words and the two-syllable words and the three-syllable words and the four-syllable words, and you have the numbers and how to write them. And then after a little bit, you have this image of a martyr um, burned at the stake and a poem, a kind of advice poem from this martyr to his children and really universally to all uh, children. And this was a conundrum to me. This was something that didn't fit and I wanted to make sense of it. And as I started to look in the literature, I, I mean, once you're clued into it, the language of martyrdom, of persecution, of a kind of cosmic battle between Antichrist and the saints who often get martyred. I mean, this language is everywhere in the literature of colonial America. And I think it's often overlooked because we don't know what to do with it. Uh, so, so this was um, fascinating to me of how to figure out, you know, what's the place of that, of that language of martyrdom, that identity of martyrdom, and how does it relate to other interpretive themes and in how we understand clo colonial America. The Mirror of Martyrs, uh, it's actually the title of multiple books, um, some of which come from the European martyrdom tradition. The, the Mirror of Martyrs was the title of the most uh, wide-selling edition of Fox's Book of Martyrs. So John Fox's Book of Martyrs, also called the Acts and Monuments, um, was an incredibly influential text in Elizabethan England and afterwards. It's a huge book. It's a monumental book. It's an expensive book, the original editions of the Acts and Monuments of Fox's Book of Martyrs. However, there's these abridgments that were actually the ones that ordinary people could afford, that they, that they could buy. And so one of the most popular um, best-selling of these abridgments was called The Mirror of Martyrs. So that's where the title comes from. Um, but more than that, I think it's a way of understanding uh, the method by which these stories looked back, in a way, to the people interpreting them. So if I'm someone who's living in colonial America and I have my hands on a copy or I'm hearing one of these stories of martyrdom, of Protestants who were martyred, then 
I'm seeing myself in that story. I'm understanding my own hardship, my own experiences of difficulty in, in a wide variety of forms as an experience of martyrdom, as an experience of persecution. So the mirror is also a metaphor for how colonists read, how they appropriated, how they used these stories as a way of understanding themselves. One of the things that's so interesting about Fox's Book of Martyrs is you have women as well as men who go to the stake. One of the most influential of the early martyrs uh, whose story is recorded in Fox and elsewhere is, is Anne Askew, this uh, Henrician martyr. She's a martyr under uh, Henry VIII. And she is phenomenal in her biblical literacy, in her ability to debate with the bishops. Uh, she is killed for her kind of nascent Protestant beliefs. And her story resonates as a kind of model for women as well as men. So, you know, whereas you would think this is a more masculine model, a, a bloody model, uh, in reality, the folklore of martyrdom is appropriated widely by women as well as men in this period, which is, which is interesting in itself. Because of the religious and political landscape of England at the time under Charles I, uh, which was more and more repressive of uh, what we sometimes call Puritans, their reform movement within the Church of England, um, these people um, were self-selecting. The ones who came to New England were self-selecting. Right? And they came for many different reasons, but one of the major reasons for which they came was to be able to practice this liberty of the ordinances, right? freedom to set up churches in a way that they felt was pure, was, was authentic. And so the landscape of early New England is in some ways very homogenous, in some ways very self-selecting. Um, of course, there's a native, a strong native population that's already present in New England. And so some of what the book explores is how natives interact with this heritage of martyrdom. Um, but also, you know, the people who came to early New England um, very quickly discover that they are not as homogenous as they thought. And there's dissenting groups that crop up almost from the beginning, antinomians, Baptists, Quakers, many other groups, um, and uh, they realized that they, uh, while they were persecuted to a certain extent in England, they now have religious minorities in their own midst, and they have to figure out what to do with these people. So to answer your question, in some ways it's a very homogenous population, but uh, deceptively so. They realize uh, very early on that they also are going to have to deal with the problem of a heterogeneous society. So both Baptists and Quakers are really interesting examples of the, the ways that the folklore of martyrdom is appropriated in very diverse ways. Uh, one of the early leaders is a man named Thomas Gould, I think a fascinating and really understudied figure in the history of early America. And uh, he's, you know, an upstanding member within his Congregationalist church and starts to have these questions about infant baptism. Baptism itself is a controversial topic in early New England uh, generally. And um, for 10 years, he debates with the leaders of his church and they try and figure out, you know, what really is biblical here? In the end, um, they, they decide that he can't stay within the church. He tries to form his own church. And because it's not an officially recognized church, it's an, it's an illegitimate church, it's not a legal church. And so Gould is imprisoned. And um, this is where things get really interesting because most New Englanders are uncomfortable with the idea of imprisoning Thomas Gould. So you actually get petitions on behalf of Gould and the other Baptists in prison. Now there's some New Englanders who think this is a good idea. We really need to guard the boundaries of orthodoxy. We came here for liberty of the ordinances. Let's keep a pure society. So we have good harvests, right? I mean, there's a kind of providential element to the, the quest for orthodoxy. Um, but Thomas Gould in 
prison understands himself through this lens of martyrdom, right? He understands uh, his defense of what he sees as biblical orthodoxy as part of the historic persecution of the church. Um, and so people want to pay Gould's fines. Um, there's actually finally a trial by jury of Thomas Gould, uh, prosecuting him really for civil unrest, for disturbing the peace. And um, to everyone's surprise, the jury acquits him, right? This heterodox person, right, who's trying to form an alternative uh, church within Boston, and uh, the jury acquits him. And so the magistrates actually send the jury back and say, rethink it, right? try and come up with a different answer. And uh, they come back with a moderate fine. Now, interestingly, and this is a moment that I think really deserves attention, Thomas Gould won't pay the fine. He could have been released from prison at that point, but he won't pay the fine because he thinks it's unjust and because remaining in prison continues this kind of martyrdom-like witness uh, for his cause. So the history of Baptists and Quakers and the way they resisted the Congregationalist establishment, uh, especially in Massachusetts, is infused with the stories from Fox's Book of Martyrs. These were their models for resisting uh, what they saw as a corrupt authority. It, as I was saying in the story about Thomas Gould, it's very common for lay people to pay the fines of religious minorities who were making a stand for their belief, especially if they suffered cheerfully. So if a Quaker or a Baptist was whipped, this was often done publicly. Uh, it could be gruesome. I mean, people watched this and, you know, not to say some of them thought, you know, this is right. We're enforcing truth, right? Even though it's difficult, we're maintaining a kind of standard of orthodoxy, which is good uh, in the long run. Um, but many people were very uncomfortable with the way that that made the dominant society, the Congregationalist, really start to look like persecutors, right? You know, and this is, you know, the Quakers and the Baptists who publish hundreds of pamphlets and tracts and treatises at this time saying New Englanders are cruel. They are persecutors. They are just like the Catholics persecuting Protestants during the English Reformation. With regard to tolerance, um, I think this real fear of seeming to be a persecutor, this real fear of being categorized with the historic lineage of persecutors is very unsettling to early New Englanders. They, don't, they may not want to tolerate everyone, but they certainly don't want to look like persecutors. And I think that's an important part of the cultural history of toleration in early America. So what I think are some of the most interesting findings over the course of uh, research for this book are uh, the ways that the folklore of martyrdom was so pervasive and used in really diverse and creative ways. So this is a folklore of stories about people who suffered, uh, who people who cared more about truth than physical uh, pleasure or health. And uh, these stories were inspiring, not just to uh, the majority or just to the establishment, but these stories were inspiring to all kinds of people, to Quakers, to Baptists, um, at various points to Christian Native Americans um, who you know, were treated terribly, especially during uh, King Philip's War in 1675 and 1676. And yet, uh, one of the magistrates for Indian Affairs, Daniel Gukin, um, was able to incorporate these, the stories of the suffering of Christian Native Americans into this narrative of historic Christian martyrdom. They, they are the true persecuted church, these natives who suffered uh, during King Philip's War. And so, you know, I think the, the immense diversity and creativity of the people of early New England is, is worth a great deal of attention.